take a look at 5.4 part 2. And again, the focus of this is going to be uh, less on drawing and more on doing things with vectors in a way that we don't have to sketch them every time. We will do a sketch if it has to do with a word problem. But if it doesn't, we're going to try to find a faster way to do some of the things we did yesterday, like adding, subtracting, and scaling. All right, so we're going to start out um, with what it basically means for two vectors to be equal. Okay, we can talk about what it means for two numbers to be equal. Well, this is what it's going to mean for two vectors to be equal. Let me show you an example first, and then I'll, I'll write it down. All right, I'm going to make up two vectors. Let's do... Uh, Take this again. So it's that one. And let's do that one. Now, are those two vectors drawn in the same spot? No. They, if you found the coordinates of this start point here, it's different than the coordinates of that start point, and the same for the endpoints. They don't have the same start and end point. But that's not what it means for vectors to be equal. For two vectors to be equal, what it means is they have the same horizontal and the same vertical components. So this one is a 2 and a 4, right 2, up 4. And this one is right 2, up 4. So those are the same vector, even though they're not drawn in the same spot. They're both this vector, 2, 4. All right, so in order for two vectors to be equal, the horizontal components have to match. Like in my last vector, they were both 2. And the vertical components have to match. And in the last one I did, they were both 4. It doesn't mean they're drawn in the same spot. I guess you could think of it as if you drag them on top of each other, would they land exactly like one over the other if you drag them on top? That's what it means for them to be equal. Okay. Any question on that idea? Okay. So again, equal vectors. And the Final way we're going to talk about how to write vectors uh, is with a notation called unit vector notation. This is also one of the easiest notations to type in on a computer because you don't need those, those angle bracket symbols. I'm not sure technically if they're the same as like the less than and greater than on a keyboard. Um, I think they're bigger, so I'd have to double check. But we don't need those special symbols with this notation. First, can someone remind me from yesterday, what, what is a unit vector? All that it means is, is what? Yep, just. Um, the magnitude equals one. Yeah, the magnitude is one. It's the vector that's one unit long. So we're going to look at two special unit vectors. Okay, so I'm going to show you two vectors on the board right now that are each one unit long, um, but they have special names. The first unit vector is called i. And in math, when we talk about i, not as an imaginary number, that's, that's totally different. But when we talk about vectors, and somebody mentions i, i is automatically defined to mean a vector that's one unit long, and it points to the right. That's a picture of the unit vector i, right there. So if you decide to pick a name for a vector, you can't use i. i is already means something else. So if you want to pick a name, pick something else. Pick a, b, or c, you know, but don't, don't use i. So i is a special vector, one unit long, and it points to the right. j is another special unit vector. It's one unit long and it points up. 
Right, so if you're driving a vector, uh, you know, like homework or something like that, and you got to pick a name for it, don't pick J. Because J means something special. So it's one unit long, and it points up. Here's a picture of J, right there. Any questions on those two special vectors? All right, so that's I and J. And remember, we talked about how we can write vectors. If you notice, well, why did I trace over it heavy? It's because when you write a vector as a single letter, it needs to be bold. But it could be bold, or you could put an arrow on top of it. Making it bold is the easiest way to do it on a computer. Uh, is putting an arrow on top of a letter isn't always easy to figure out how to do. So sticking with bold is, is probably what we'll do. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a certain amount of I's and a certain amount of J's, and we're going to see if we can build a vector. Kind of think of I and J as like Lego pieces, and we're going to stack them together, and we're going to make something. Let's look at an example. I want to take the vector 3, 4, and I want to write that in what we call unit vector notation. Right, so let's, let's draw the vector 3, 4. Remember, it doesn't matter where we start. You can start anywhere you want. Just make sure that you go three units right and then four units up. So let's start here. Uh, and also make sure wherever you start, you have enough room, so that's important. And we're going to go three right, and then four up. So that's the vector three, four. Now, let's take and take these two vectors, the i and the j, and let's stack them together and see how many of each we need to kind of travel from here up to here. Let's start with the eyes. How many of these eyes am I going to have to stack together to get from where I'm starting to the finish point of my vector? Yeah, three. I'm going to need three of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make three copies. Try to just put them over here. So there's one. There's two. And there's three. So what I did is I just built the vector 3i. I needed three of the i's. So let's write that down. 3i plus, now I need a certain amount of j's to get me to the finish point, or the terminal point. Um, how many j's am I going to need? Okay. Four. Yeah, then I need four J's. So let's make four copies of that vector. Maybe. There we go. And just stack them all up. So we got one, two, three, and four. This is very similar to what we did yesterday when we added a bunch of vectors together. Now, to see the result of stacking three i's together with four j's, you would connect where you started to where you stopped. And that's exactly the vector three, four, but it's now being built out of i's and j's. And that's the answer. So to write a vector in unit vector notation, you have to think about how many i's you would need and then how many j's you would have to stack together, i's and j's. Now, i points to the right and j points up. What if I had a vector, say, like this? Well, I could use i's, could use three of the i's, but that would get me to the right. But j only goes up. How do you think i would go down? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, you can use negative j's, right? If you use, in this case, 3i. 1, 2, 3. That gets me 3 right. Now I need to go 3 down. 1, 2, 3. Well, down would be negative 3 again. Right? So by making i's positive and negative, you can go up, down, left, or right. You can build any vector you want out of i's and j's. And if you went halfway across a block, you can use half an i. You can scale it. Right? So if you had something like, let's say, that. Well, it looks like we went two to the right. So that would be two of the i's plus one, two, and a half. So that's plus two and a half j. So decimals are perfectly fine. All right. So using i's and j's, you can basically go in any direction you want, any length you need to go, and that's all you need. Now, when we do 3D, we're going to have to add one more unit vector in here. We're going to use the unit vector k. And that would be the vector that would come out and go into the board. Okay, but for 2D, all you need to worry about is how to travel in two directions, horizontal travel and vertical travel. And i and j cover both of those. That's all you need. Okay, so any question on, on that idea? So as we go through the different things we're going to do today, we'll practice doing some answers in unit, unit vector notation, and then we'll do some the way we learned yesterday. Okay, they're both they're, they're pretty similar. I just think this one's actually easier to write on a computer than, than the other one. All right. So we're going to look at doing some of the same things we did yesterday, except this time. Uh, we're not going to do any sketching. Okay, so we're going to look at adding, subtracting, scaling, but no drawing. So the formulas I'm about to give you, um, V and W represent two vectors. And technically they should be bold. And alpha, just what the book uses, alpha is going to represent a scalar. So remember, a scalar is just a number that can make a vector longer or shorter, like 5j. 5 is a scalar. Right. Here are our two vectors. When we do an actual problem in a couple minutes, we are going to have numbers in all those spots. But for now, let's just say that vector v has a horizontal and a vertical component. And vector w also has a horizontal and a vertical component. They could be the same. They could be different. It, you know, just four numbers would be in those four spots. Any, any numbers, positives, negatives, decimals. So if we wanted to add vectors up, the way we have to do it visually is like this. We have this one. We have one like that. We have to put one on the end of the other, and then we have to connect the diagonal. Not bad for two, but the one Vivian asked me about where I had to do like seven or eight of them. I had to do, and I had three different vectors, and one of them was 15 units long. So that gets kind of annoying. Right? We can run out of space. So to add vectors without making a sketch, all you have to do is take the horizontal component of the first vector, take the horizontal component of the second vector, and add them together. And that's the new horizontal and the final answer. To get the vertical in the final answer, take the vertical component of the first vector and the vertical component of the second, add them together, and that's the vertical component in the final answer. So this eliminates having to do any kind of sketch when we want to add vectors up. Um, subtracting is very similar. When we did a sketch, subtracting was a little bit more, a little bit more annoying because to do subtraction, we had to take the second vector, flip it around, and then put it on the end. 
Now, we don't have to do any of that. Take your horizontal components and subtract them. Remember, subtraction order matters. So look at the order they want you to do. In this case, it was the V minus the W. So make sure you do the X1 minus the X2, not the other way around. Right? And then Y1 minus Y2. And we're going to do an example of that with numbers next. All right, so scalar product. Remember, there's three things that can happen when you scale a vector. Does anybody remember one thing that can happen when you scale a vector? Yes? Could get shorter. Could get shorter, yeah. Could get longer. And one other thing that can happen if you use a certain kind of number. Yep. It could change direction. If you use a negative, it would cause it to flip around. All right. So that's, that's what's happening here. This is a scalar product. Which one of those three things is happening, I don't know. I don't know what, what this number is. But all we have to do to do a scalar product is think of it like a distributive property. Take each component in your vector, the x1 and the y1, and multiply each of them by the number that you want to scale it by. So if you want it to triple a vector, you triple the horizontal component, and you triple the vertical component. And that would make it three times as long. Now we don't have to stack them together and possibly go off our graph paper or any of that. Let's just think of it almost like a distributed property. And the last one, we haven't done this one numerically yet. Kind of gave you a hint at how to do it. And when I did a sketch today, you might have gotten an idea of how you would find the length of a vector that's on a diagonal. Uh, but what does that symbol mean again when you put the double bars around it? Okay. Um, or like it's absolute value, right? Well, absolute value is something when we have single bars. So this is the, the double bars. So it's a little bit different, but it, it's kind of a similar idea. Yeah? Is it the magnitude? It's the magnitude, which basically means how long is the vector. So if we go back and look at even this example here, how could you find the length of the vector in black in that picture? Yeah? Yeah, you can use the Pythagorean theorem. This side is 3, this side is 4. So if you use Pythagorean theorem, you would have the square root of 25, which would mean the magnitude of that vector is 5 units. So all you have to do is look at this component, which is 3, square it. Look at this component, which is 4, and square it. Add them together and take the square root. You're doing exactly what the Pythagorean theorem is. Square the 3, square the 4, add them up and take the square root. So in general, we had a 3 and a 4, but take your horizontal, square it. Take your vertical, square it. Add them up, and take the square root. And that's how you find the magnitude of a vector. All right, so let's try an example where we go through each one of those um, calculations. All right, so now you've got actual numbers. Um, I've written the vectors two different ways. The first way I did was unit vector notation. The second way, our book calls that an algebraic vector. And when we write the answers to the questions, I'm going to have you guys try it both ways, but on the test. I'll be specific and I'll ask you to write it one way or the other. 
You're not going to have to write the same answer two different ways. All right, so the first one, um, it says to do V plus W. No sketch. We don't want to sketch it. All right, so if I added V and W together, um, what would be the horizontal part of my answer? Yep, Tom? Five. Yeah, five. And what letter do we put with it to indicate that it's horizontal? Um, I. So you have two I's, plus we're adding in a vector that had three I's. That's going to give me five I. And what about the vertical component? So we know we're going five right, but what about the up and down? James? Three down, one. down one. So that's minus j. We have 3j. You're going to add negative 4j. 3 plus negative 4 is negative 1. You don't have to put a negative 1 in front of the j. You can just write this. That's fine. Now, how would I write that if I wanted to do it with the angle bracket? Yes? Um, five, negative one. Five, negative one. So when you write it in the angle brackets, you don't use any letters. It's just two numbers separated with a comma, just like a coordinate, except it's the, it's the brackets. When you write it as a unit vector, you use letters. Okay. Questions on that? OK, so that's V plus W. Um, let's try. V minus W. Let's write our answer first using I and J. Let's start with that. So Colby, what would be the uh, horizontal part when I do V minus J? Um, v minus W. It'll just be five. Um, the only way they could come out the same when you add or you subtract is if they were both zero. But since the components here aren't zero, adding them versus subtracting them. Become negative i. Yeah, it's going to be negative i. Yep. Yeah. So two i, take away three i. You're not wrong if you put negative one i. You can do that, but I'm just going to put negative i. And Jacob, how about um, the vertical? J. All right, what's the vertical um, component in V? What unit vector represents moving up and down, I or J? Fifty fifty. J. J. Great guess. So J represents moving up and down. So how many J's do we have in vector V? One. What number is in front of J? In vector V. Three. Three. So the vertical component of vector V is three. What's the vertical component in W? Uh, what number is in front of the oh, negative, four. negative four. So you have three in the first one, negative four in the second one, and you're subtracting them. So what's three minus negative four? Seven. Seven. So the final answer has a vertical component of seven J. If you wanted to write it uh, in the other notation, Both answers are correct. On the test, you'll only have to write one or the other. 
So, A involved using two vectors. If you're going to add things together, you need two things to add. If you're going to subtract, you need two things. If you're going to do a scalar product, you only need one thing. It's like taking a square root. I said you take a square root of a number. I only need to give you one number, and you can do a square root. It's kind of like this. So 3D. Um, oh, no. You think you could tell me what 3D would be? Six i plus nine j. So we're going to triple each component. So triple the triple the two and triple the three. Six i plus nine j. Okay. Any questions on that one? Do you triple the three that was in with j or i? Uh, so it's like when we have a three here, you're tripling both those numbers. Did I write that? 6i plus 9j? Yes. Um, this one, you don't need to use at all for this problem. But we might need it again, so I won't cross it out. All right, so just think of it like a distributive property. And last one, find the magnitude of v. So this is where we're going to be using our formula, it looks like, the Pythagorean theorem. Um, can anybody help me set that up? Jayden? The square root of 2i squared. And just use the numbers. Okay. We don't need the letters. Square root of 2 squared. Yep. Uh, and 3 squared. So, 3 squared. Yeah, so the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. Because remember, that 2 and 3, those are just two sides of a triangle. You're finding the hypotenuse. That's the vector. Yeah. Uh, let's see. When we add that up, um, what do I get? The square root of? How much? 13. 13, yes. 13 is a prime number, so I know that can't be reduced. If I had an answer like square root of 16, well, I would definitely reduce it. Or if I had something like square root of 20, you should reduce it to two square roots of five. Okay, just like what you did with unit, circle, tray, again, throughout the whole year. If you see a square root you can reduce, go ahead and reduce it. Okay, so any questions on adding, subtracting, scaling, or finding the magnitude? without any sketches. Okay. So, what we want to look at now is a kind of problem where they give you a vector and you figure out how long it is and if it's not one unit long, you make it one unit long. So in other words, you scale it. If it's too short, you make it longer. If it's too long, you make it shorter. But the goal is to make it exactly one unit long. So I put up a reminder about what it means to be a unit vector. We have that in the notes from yesterday. So let's look at a couple examples and see if, um, if we notice a pattern. Let's say we had a vector, and let's say I had a length of 3. I want to know what to scale by to make length equal 1. So the second column says, what do I have to scale it by to make the length equal 1? So let's say it was 3. What would you scale it by to make it exactly 1? Yep. Yeah. yeah, you divide by 3. Yeah, you could, you could say you divide by 3 or multiply by 1 third, same thing. But you'd scale it by 1 third. What if it was a length of 5? What would you have to scale it by to make it 
one unit lot. Okay? One fifth. One fifth, or divide by five. That, that's even better if you say it that way. Um, what if it was one quarter of a unit? So now the vector is too short. What would you scale it by to make it one unit long if it started out as a quarter unit? Yep. Four. Four. So now let's kind of think about it in general. What if the vector was x units long? What would you scale it by to make it one unit? Yeah. One, over x. one over x, exactly. You divide it by x, or you basically divide it by its length. Dividing something by its length, which is like dividing it by itself, will always give you one. All right. So I, that's why I put these up with numbers first, just to kind of get you to see the pattern. It's always divide by the length. Right? That's how you convert something into a unit vector. Right? Let's write that down. Um, so that's what I already explained. We're going to be finding a unit vector. I'll give you a vector, and you're going to turn it into a unit vector, which means you're not going to change the direction of it. It's still going to point the same way. All you're going to do is either make it a little longer or a little shorter, so it's exactly one unit. And how are you going to do that? Exactly what Jaden just said. To take a vector that is x units long and turn it into something one unit long, multiply it by 1 over x. Or as Jess said earlier, divide it by x. Divide it by its length. Here's the formula. To convert something into a unit vector, take your vector and divide by its length. What do you have to divide? Everything. The horizontal number and the vertical number. Divide both numbers by its length. And that'll give you a unit vector. Now, if I give you a vector that's already a unit vector, then you don't have to do anything. But if it's not a unit vector, which is most likely what I'm going to give you, you have to scale it so it is. So step one, find the length. Step two, divide by that length. Each component. scroll down a little bit more. Uh, does everybody have the formula? So it says to find a unit vector for the vector 3i minus 4j. So step one, let's figure out if it already is a unit vector. And if it is, we're done. To figure out if it's a unit vector, find its length, find its magnitude. So we just did one of those at the end of the last problem. Um, can someone help me set up my formula to find the length of B? Yeah, it doesn't really matter if you use the negative or not. It's going to be squared. It's going to go away. So if you include it, it's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. And what's that? The square root of how much? That's the square root of 25, which is 5. So question, is my vector right now a unit vector? Too long or too short? Too long. too long. How many times too long is it? Five. five. It's five times bigger than it should be. So what am I going to scale it by to make it five times smaller? Uh, one fifth. 
one fifth. We're going to basically divide each component of the vector by five. I'm going to do exactly what it says right here. Take the vector and divide by its magnitude. The magnitude is five. All right, so here's my vector. 3i minus 4j and divide each component by 5. And that's the new vector. 3 fifths i minus 4 fifths j. So we just scaled it down 5 times smaller. And now it's exactly one unit long. If you wanted to write it uh, the other way, you could do that. And that's the same thing. So any questions on how we converted that vector into a unit vector? We just scale it. We had to find what to scale it by. And it was five, or one fifth. Any questions? Yes? Can you move the end? You have to have the negative back. Oh, geez, yeah, that's important. Yeah. If you're going to write it that way, you've got to have the right number. Yes, thank you. Positive three fifths, negative four fifths. Yep. And here the negative goes away because negative four times negative four is positive 16 plus positive nine. So that's why you get positive 25. All right, so that's finding a unit vector. And the last thing we're going to look at is an application we kind of talked a little about yesterday with the airplanes, and that's a velocity vector. So remember, vectors are used to describe two things. Something that has a magnitude and something that has a direction. When you're talking about velocity, the magnitude is speed. How fast is it going? The direction is, well, the direction. Is it going up, down, left, or right? Which way is it going? We're going to look um, at an example and see if we can figure out what the formula is to find a velocity vector. The key to remember is that when you're finding a vector, it has two components. Well, at least in 2D. We're not doing 3D yet. So we're doing 2D. So think about when you throw an object. Unless you throw it exactly up, down, left, or right, the object is traveling in two directions. Like somebody throws a baseball, a pitcher. Yes, it's mostly traveling forward, but it might travel up and down a little bit as well. Now it might be traveling down. If the pitcher releases it up near you know, his you know, shoulder, you know, now they're pitching it down by maybe the guy's waist. So it, it is going down a little bit. So it's traveling in two directions. If somebody hits, a, you know, it's like a pop fly. It's going up, but it's also probably traveling out a little bit, unless it goes exactly straight up at home plate and comes exactly straight down. But that usually doesn't happen. All right, so let's look at our example. Let's pretend that this line in black represents an object being thrown. In this case, it's being thrown up and to the right. To figure out the formula for a velocity vector, it's going to have two parts to it. It's going to have a horizontal part. I need to figure that out. And it's going to have a vertical part. Now, what they'll tell you to describe the direction when an object is being thrown, is an angle. That's how the direction is going to be described. The person threw the object at a 40 degree angle, 50 degree angle, 10 degree angle. Okay, they threw it at an angle. There's your direction. They threw the object at a 10 degree angle at 50 miles an hour. There's your speed, 50 miles an hour. So you're going to know those two things. How fast they threw it and what angle they threw it at. We have to convert that into a horizontal and a vertical component. So we're going to think about it. Um, does anybody have a, a thought about what kind of shape 
I could make out of what's there. Yeah? Right. Right. How would you make a triangle out of it? Um, going to the right, to the point of the point. Okay, so take, draw a line from, from where? From the origin. From here? Okay. And then to where? To the ending point. To the ending point? With the x axis. So from the origin to the ending point of the x axis, like that? No. <laughs> to the ending point of the other direction. How about we start by saying from the end point of the vector yeah, to good. where? Not from here. We don't want to draw anything from here because you already have you do want you already have two things from there. You've got the horizontal, and you've got this one that's at an angle. So we want to draw a third side, but it won't be over here. It's going to go from here. Would just be from the ending point to the Yeah, perpendicular to the horizontal. Just draw it straight down. So we're going to draw a line just like this. Now let's think about that vector in black, right? It's a vector. Think about how you would build it. It would be built from a horizontal, that one in red, and from a vertical, that one in green. If you stack the red and the green together, you just built the one in black. That's what we learned yesterday. So the red one has to go right there. So you have to figure out what the red one is. And the green one is going to go right there. The red one is the horizontal, and the green one is the vertical. What we need to figure out about this vector is how long it is. That's the two numbers that go here. Both of those numbers are lengths. How long is the red and how long is the green? So for now, let's call the red one x and the green one we could call y. Um, let's start with x. Not this kind of thing before. What is the name of x because it's right next to theta? What do we call the side that's right next to your angle? Yep. Adjacent. Right, this side is adjacent. And what do we call the side that's across from the 90? James? What was your question again? Um, the side across from the 90. The side across from the 90? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, well, what do we call it, though, in general, in any triangle? Oh, the hypotenuse. That's the hypotenuse. All right. So I want to try to come up with a formula to find the length of x. And once I find that, it's going to go in the spot I circled in red. What trig function would involve adjacent and hypotenuse? Traces are sine, cosine, or tangent. Yeah. Cosine. Cosine. So let's set that up. Cosine of theta equals adjacent over. Now, technically, it's over hypotenuse, but what do I mean by that? What about the hypotenuse? The color of the hypotenuse, how heavy the hypotenuse is, adjacent over the, the what of the hypotenuse, yeah? The length of the hypotenuse, or the way we say it with vectors, the magnitude of the hypotenuse. So the cosine theta 
equals the length of the adjacent, which I'm calling x, over the length of the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of b. And now, um, let's get x by itself. How would I move magnitude of v to the other side? Okay. You multiply everything by the magnitude of v. Multiply everything by the magnitude of v. So the formula for the horizontal component of a vector, when you throw an object at a certain angle, is how fast you threw the object, that's the magnitude of it, times the cosine of the angle you threw the object at. That's your horizontal component. So that would go in the first spot. All right, so let's start to build this. Uh, so we've got magnitude of V, cosine alpha. And now I need the, the, um, the vertical. So now let's go back and figure out why. Now, focus on what I'm circling in blue. What side Y? We didn't label that one yet. Yep, Amy? Opposite. That's opposite. What trig function would involve opposite and hypotenuse? So let's set this up. Sine of angle equals opposite over hypotenuse. Y is the opposite, the length of the opposite, over the length of the hypotenuse, which we call magnitude. And now do the same thing James said before to get Y by itself. Multiply each side by the magnitude. So you throw an object at a certain angle at a certain speed. If you want to find the vertical component from throwing the object, it's how fast you threw the object times the sine of the angle you threw the object at. That's your vertical. Magnitude V sine theta. And if you wanted to write it with the ij notation, you could do the same thing. Put that there. Just put an i next to it so we know it's the horizontal. And put that there once you do it out on the calculator. And put a j next to it so we know it's the vertical. I think I have that written a little nicer on the next page rather than just drawing arrows. But that's basically what I'm going to have written on the next page. So, they have to give you two things when you do this kind of problem. They'll give you the initial speed, which is uh, this magnitude of v, that's the initial speed. And the other thing they have to give you is the angle that you threw the object at. That's going to be this. So they'll give you the two things I just circled. And to use those two things to find a velocity vector, um, this is how you do it. So magnitude of v times the cosine of, I'm going to use theta because that's what I use with you guys. It's not what the book used, but that's fine. Plus magnitude of v sine theta. So it's exactly the same formula I wrote on the other page. Magnitude times cosine plus magnitude times sine. Let me double check. Magnitude times cosine, yep, with an i. Magnitude times sine with a j. Again, theta is the angle you throw the object at. That's how fast you throw the object. All right, 
So let's finish up um, with an example of that. You do need a calculator to do it because the, uh, when you take the sine and cosine of the angle, usually it's a decimal. So we'll, we'll use a calculator. Suppose that we throw an object at 50 miles per hour at an angle of 30 degrees. Find the velocity vector and write the answer in unit vector form. That means they want the answer with an I and a J in it, not the angle brackets. All right, so let's start um, with my horizontal. Can someone remind me what? is the formula for the horizontal part, the part that's going to go in front of the eye. Yes? Magnitude times the cosine. Yep, the magnitude times the cosine of the angle. What's the magnitude in this one? 50 miles an hour. 50 cosine. And what's the angle that we're throwing it at? 30 degrees. And what that really represents is the speed in the horizontal direction. Because this object has two speeds. It's traveling horizontally and it's traveling vertically. Plus, now we need the vertical. We need to do these out, but I'm just putting them in boxes for now. Um, how do we calculate the vertical speed? Fifty times sine of thirty degrees. And now I just have to type those in. Okay, before I type them in, though, I have a question. Which one of those speeds technically is not changing through the entire problem? The horizontal or the vertical? Yeah. The horizontal. The horizontal minus air resistance. But the horizontal speed should stay the same the whole time. The vertical is changing because of gravity. Right? If I throw something at an angle, well, it's hard to see, but if I go like this, it was traveling right at the same speed the whole time. But it wasn't traveling up at the same speed. It was going up fast at first, then all of a sudden it stopped going up, and then it switched directions and it came back down. So the vertical speed changes because of gravity. But the horizontal minus air resistance, it doesn't really change. All right, so let's figure out um, what that comes out to. First, check the calculator. They gave me an angle in degrees. Let's not accidentally do something in radians at this point. That would not be a good mistake. All right, and now type it in. 50 cosine 30. So the speed in the horizontal direction, if you throw something at 50 miles an hour at a 30 degree angle, is 43.3. That would be like speed if, if a pitcher threw a ball at a 10 degree angle, even though it's going at a 50, degree, at a 50 miles an hour at an angle, it's only traveling forward at 43.3. Because some of that energy is going into fighting gravity, not moving it forward. And um, the vertical component. There's not going to be a big vertical component. I mean, a 30 degree angle, if you threw it at a 90 degree angle, then it would be all vertical. But when you throw it at a 30, it's mostly moving forward. So this is going to be a smaller number. 50 sine 30, okay, 25. So 25 miles an hour, that would be the speed if you were in like a helicopter above the pitcher throwing it, and you pointed a radar gun straight down, the ball would be coming up at the helicopter at 25 miles an hour. And this would be if you were standing at the batter and you know the ball hit you, 
it would hit you at 43 miles an hour. If they threw, if the pitcher threw the ball at a zero degree angle, then that means it would just be going perfectly straight, and it would, all the energy would go into moving it forward. But that's not the case here. So that's uh, what they were looking for. Questions on that? So that's 5.4, um, part two. So we're halfway done. Um, tomorrow we'll do 5.5, five, and then on Thursday we'll do 5.6, which is mostly, mostly review. So, homework for tonight. Um, I'm just going to change one of them, maybe two of those. Um, so you don't have to do 66. Anything else? Okay, so 25 to 47 odd and 55 and 57 on page 344.